Hi, thank you for staying around. I'm very, very, very happy to um, present, introduce uh, this pretty, pretty fabulous panel. Uh, new voices of attempt survivors. Uh, very brief intros and then we're gonna send them into it. Each of them has about 10 minutes to do their thing. Wonderful people. We have today uh, Desiree Stage, Brooklyn-based photographer and founder of the Live Through This Project, which is currently cycling there on the screen. And we have Samantha Nadler, who runs a crisis program in Nashville. <laughs> and <laughs> We have Misha Kessler, who is uh, a young graduate, young professional, and a consumer advocate with many groups, including the Jed Foundation. I think he is their PR ambassador at the moment. And, and we have Craig A. Miller, um, who is, I believe, tech, exe tech executive by day, an author, and very good public speaker uh, the rest of the time. So I'm going to hand it over to them. Thanks. I'm not gonna lie, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like Kara did a great intro for me. Um, my name is Desiree. I am a suicide attempt survivor. About three and a half years ago, I started the pro my project called Live Through This, which you're seeing here. Uh, and what it is is a series of the portraits and stories of suicide attempt survivors as told in their voices. People often ask how I got here and why I would choose to throw all of my passion into something so dark, which I'm sure most of you understand. So I wanna talk about that for a minute. Um, I lost a friend to suicide for the first time when I was about 15 years old. I didn't handle that well. Um, and around the same time, I was dealing with uh, drug addiction and violence in my household, not, not me. Um, I fell into a deep depression for the first time. I started questioning my sexuality and because of that, because I didn't know how to cope with that, I started cutting myself, which was a struggle that, I, that lasted for about nine years. Um, while all this was happening, I remember feeling alone and completely misunderstood. I had no one to talk to. And it was about then that I decided I was gonna pursue psychology so that I could help other people like me. I wanted someone to talk to where there was no one, so I wanted to become the one to talk to. And as an undergraduate, I was told over and over that I could not pursue research in suicide and self-injury until I made it to grad school. And I like to make this joke about how it wasn't that I was turned away from, by one or two faculty members because I fell in love a lot and I moved around the country a lot. And so a lot of faculty members said no to me. Um, and there was one exception, and he was He's a really important part of my life, Dr. Dula at uh, my alma mater, East Tennessee State. He was really kind of a fearless man and he encouraged this in me. So I was a research assistant in his lab and I also volunteered at the local crisis center. I learned assist and later QPR. And it was this experience that prompted me to apply to grad school when I otherwise might not have. At the same time, I was deeply entrenched in a relationship that was both emotionally and physically abusive. And it escalated in a textbook fashion, um, you know, from the threats to the pushing to the nothing visible um, to a black eye. And when it got to a point where I was retaliating, it felt like something broke in me. And I think that that's when the serious suicidal thoughts started. About six months after I graduated, uh, undergrad, I attempted suicide. It was summer and I was set to start a PhD program in the fall. Mm, I found out my partner was cheating on me and I just I lost it. But it was a catalyst. The writing had been on the wall for well over a year by that point. And afterwards I felt that familiar feeling of being alone again, of being shamed. So much so that I literally fled the, the small town that I lived in. I went to Texas. <laughs> um, I just couldn't bear to face the whispers and the rumors and running into people in the grocery store looking at me like, really, you did that? Um, so I'm gonna skip forward a little bit, but uh, suffice it to say that grad school didn't work out. There was no more support in studying suicide there than there was as an undergraduate. And I was still struggling with this breakup and then I lost my best friend to suicide. So it's actually kind of funny that I'm here with all of you today anyway. <laughs> in some way, it feels like a big triumph. Um, 
but after the grad school. Thank you. So after all that, after the grad school debacle, I decided that I thought I could put it all down and, and just move on and do something else. But I really wasn't sure how because I'd had my whole life planned out. Um, and then suddenly there was nothing. So I moved to New York with nothing, a thousand dollars and no plan, and I fell into a career in the music industry. I also started teaching myself how a camera worked by photographing rock stars, by getting on industry lists. And so I was exploring other options. <laughs> and in that time, I fell in love with my camera. I took it everywhere with me. Um, but it took me about three years to realize that all of the things that I was doing were not fulfilling to me. I was meeting and photographing people that I had been obsessed with since I was a teenager, but um, it wasn't working, and I was doing these things that a pre-attempt version of me could only have dreamed of. Uh, it still didn't feel right. And I'd set out to change the world as a young adult, and I, I wasn't doing that, so I wanted to do that. I wanted to go back to that. Um, so I started to live through this in 2010, and I was kind of wondering where everyone was, why these stories weren't out there, why there were no resources for us. I was looking for other people like me, um, because I knew I couldn't be the only one. And I remembered how shameful it felt. Um, I was certain that we didn't fit into these neat little boxes and certain that we were hiding silently anywhere and everywhere. And I wanted to give us all a voice somehow. Um, I wanted to put faces to the numbers that we read about. I wanted to cast anonymity aside. All of these people share their names with me. That's, that's a part of the, the agreement. I wanted to share the stories that desperately needed to be heard, that I needed to hear back then, back in 2006. So that's what I do. I meet with an attempt survivor and we have a conversation. It's very informal. What led up to the attempt? What happened afterward? Where they are now? How they feel about those experiences? Who supported them or who didn't? Uh, what's important to them in terms of their care? Or anything else that comes up? It's all very organic. And afterward, I make a portrait. What I want is for the viewer to look directly into the eyes of this person. You'll notice they're all looking into the lens. I wanted to challenge the stereotypes that we all have and to see what we really look like. And I think it's particularly telling in the moments just after this story is kind of released into the world, because in a lot of cases it's being told for the first time in detail. Which is interesting when you think about it because people are putting their jobs and their reputations on the line. Google is a very, very powerful tool, as we, as we know. Um, and once something's on the internet, it never goes away, you know. <laughs> it's there forever, you're stuck. <laughs> and when I ask them why, why they do this, why they agree to me putting them on the internet, um, the answer is simple. It's that they want to help. They want people to know that they're not alone. So I pair the portrait with an excerpt of the survivor's story, and then I put it on my website. Uh, which is livethroughthis.org. <laughs> um, and it is curated to some extent. I don't put the whole transcript on there because we're usually talking for about an hour and a half and it's, it's long. I also don't share methods on the website, even though they are 99% of the time shared with me. Um, I pull what I think is gonna resonate most with, with the audience and whatever seems poignant. And that's what I publish. What I like about having the website as the main vehicle for this project is that it's accessible. It's accessible at any time of the day for anyone who needs it. And that means attempt survivors, lost survivors, anybody. So at this point, I've interviewed nearly 80, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I've interviewed nearly 80 attempt survivors from all over the country. Uh, and I learned that I was right about my hunch, that we come in every color, sexual orientation, gender presentation, faith, and age group. As some of us have lived with homelessness, We've lived through sexual or emotional abuse or abandonment, and some of us are perfectly normal human beings who don't know what went wrong. We're productive members of society who've wanted to die, who've tried to do so, and who've overcome it, but who also, in a lot of cases, are still struggling with this. I know that I continue to struggle with suicidal thoughts sometimes. But we're so much more than a label. These lived experiences are incredibly valuable we're like a gold mine for suicide prevention, and it's so fantastic to finally hear our voices being heard. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 
ignoring you, Kara. <laughs> so I'm almost done. Last summer, I interviewed a man named Dustin Hill. I was hoping the timing would be right. Uh, and he, like several others, asked me what I get out of doing this. And until I met him, I didn't have an answer, or I hadn't conceptualized it as such. But what I get is a community of people who understand my deepest pain, and I understand theirs. There's an immediate connection, this bond, a trust, and we can cut through the everyday surface crap and just really see one another for who we are. So I realized that I had a community, but I needed to share that community um, to connect them all to one another. And I started a closed Facebook group. I added everyone who had been a part of the project. And uh, I've been interested in this idea of peer support groups for some time now because there are so few of them. Um, and it was, it's an interesting experiment. And at first I was wary because there were a couple of people who were, who were sharing these experiences in, in what I felt was a triggering way. Um, and I said something at first and then I sat back and I just watched. And what I found was that people started responding right away. There's always someone there, uh, which is kind of amazing. Um, and April has asked me what my best practices are. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I don't have a model here. There are no rules. Be careful. <laughs> um, but they're well educated. They're empathetic. They share two experiences. It's having lived through a suicidal crisis, or more than one, and having shared their story in detail in a very public way. It self-regulates. It is not anonymous. These are people who, while, behind, while they might be behind a computer monitor, they know that this is a real person on the other side and that they have a connection, even if they've never met before. They're invested in helping each other continue to live. And even when it feels impossible, there's a hand for them to hold. So with all of that said, I guess the question is, why am I doing this? What do I want? What I want is for us to stop being discounted. I want us to have a voice when it comes to our own care and recovery. I want society to see these struggles to be as commonplace as any other health struggle. And I want people to know what to do when they come into contact with a suicidal person. I want to see suicide prevention skills being taught in schools, being taught to doctors, to nurses, anybody in the public sector, anybody who is dealing with people. Servers, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to see, more than anything, the pity and fear in the eyes of someone when I say that I have been suicidal, or God forbid if I someday have to say that again. Three years ago, all of this seemed like a pipe dream, this. And now, not so much, not after what we've done here this week. Not only have I found a community of attempt survivors, but I found within that community a group of advocates. Fighters who are willing to stand up together, who want to be the change they want to see, and who are doing so by coming out of the shame closet and using their voices and their stories to educate those who haven't been there. I am more than a label. Today I stand up. I stand up as an attempt survivor and as someone who wants to see and make real lasting change happen. And I hope you'll stand with me because more and more it becomes clear to me that I am never alone, that we are never, ever alone. Kind of hard to follow that, but I'll try. That's okay. That's okay. My name is Samantha Nadler, and I, as Carrie Anna mentioned, I supervise the crisis line in Nashville. Um, I want to start off with a story about how I accidentally um, started telling my story. I had an experience where I had an opportunity to work face-to-face uh, -face with suicide attempt survivors, and my job told me this is not an age thing, but we just don't think you have enough experience to do that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had to quickly correct them and say, actually, no, that's far from the truth. And that's how I ended up sharing my story. My story is that I survived eight attempts. My last and most lethal was in May of 2008, and it uh, landed me in the ICU for four days. My first uh, experience with suicidal ideations was when I was 12 years old. And following that, throughout my adolescence, I was hospitalized many times. Uh, one of the most um, frequent ones were about eight hospitalizations within 14 months. I, um, I attempted that many times because I felt trapped and hopeless and felt like I had no other options. 
I was a minor for the majority of my attempts, so I think that played a role in feeling trapped and like I had no options because I wasn't an adult. I couldn't make those choices. Like many with lived experience, I grew up in an environment that had its own issues. Um, my issues were family drug use, a divorce, a long custody battle, and a very long history of mental health issues in the family that of course no one talked about. I did this not because I wanted to die, but because I didn't think I had any other options and I just wanted relief. Um, unfortunately, that was the way I found my relief and often felt disappointed when I found out that I survived. So as I mentioned, I work at the crisis line now. I started as a volunteer in 2009. I was one year out from my lethal attempt and I did not disclose that I was a suicide attempt survivor out of fear that I would not be um, accepted as a volunteer. I did tell them that my sister had attempted suicide, which is true, and that that was my exposure to suicide. I worked on the lines um, as a volunteer for a couple months and then I was hired on full time and did that for three years. And then I was promoted as a supervisor about two years ago and I've been doing that since then. I also facilitate a survivors of suicide support group and that's for family and friends who have lost loved ones to suicide. I started becoming involved with the Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network and that was who provided the opportunity for me to facilitate a suicide attempt group. And since then, I've had uh, multiple speaking opportunities through TSPN to raise awareness in Middle Tennessee. With the guidance of two great mentors who I'm really thankful that are here in this room with me, I was able to find out that I can do work in this field even though I have this experience and that my experience can be valuable to the work. And they were very supportive in me coming out of the mental health closet. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> I'm also in a social work program. I'm uh, about to start my last year um, in that program, so I'm hoping that I'll be a little bit more involved on a graduate level soon. A lot of people ask, why do I do this work? Um, why do I work in mental health since it's obviously impacted me so much? Um, I do this because I wanna provide a perspective and an understanding that lacks in the mental health arena we were talking about this in the first panel, we're being talked about, but we're not included in that conversation, and I'm tired of being left out. This is about my experience and my treatment. Why am I not allowed to have a voice in this? It also means that if I'm open, that others can be too. And we see this a lot in the suicide prevention trainings that we do. Um, I, was in, I became an assist trainer in the last year, and. I will often share that I'm an attempt survivor, and it's interesting because after that, many of our participants will share then too that they are a survivor. And I'm not sure if that would have happened if I had mentioned it, but I hope that that empowers them to talk about it. I also wanted to prove to myself that I can do the work and that I can contribute even though I have this experience. And I wanna show that suicide attempt survivors are not hopeless and we can be helped even when we do deal with chronic thoughts of suicide or multiple attempts and that this can happen to anyone. It doesn't have to be someone who, you know, is poor or homeless or has a severe mental illness. It can be anybody. Coming out, telling my story has helped me because it empowers me. It gives me a voice that I didn't have because I was quiet and Though I did the work, I didn't feel like I can tell anybody that I was someone who had this lived experience. And that empowerment allows me to empower others. Breaking the silence allows me not to be a victim of my history, that I can use it for good and not just be the person who has multiple attempts or a lot of mental health issues. I feel that talking about it also contributes to the movement of it's okay to talk about this. And if someone can't be brave, if the people here can't be brave and share their story, then there's not gonna be anybody else who can follow us and do the same. It's also acted as a buffer for me because if I put myself out there and I share my story, it almost puts a responsibility on me that I can't do that now. And that's something that I struggled with even within the last year. Um, I still struggle with thoughts of suicide. I was very suicidal about six months ago and I'm really glad that I'm open about it because 
my supervisor was able to ask me about that, and I would not, even today, would not have been able to say it. But just because I struggle doesn't mean that I'm going to attempt again or that I'm hopeless or that I can't be helped. I refuse to be silent in my struggle. I refuse to let my community believe that I and that we here are untreatable and that we're a lost cause. It's my responsibility to make sure that my experience and the work that I'm doing lets others know who are also struggling with thoughts of suicide that they are also never alone. Thank you. So my name is Misha Kessler, and I am a suicide attempt survivor. Now, I would actually like to discuss what I have perceived to be a slight hesitation or resistance to, to supporting suicide attempt survivors in our field. My ultimate goal is to give you all insight into why this advocacy work and my openness is so vital to me personally, thereby giving another perspective and encouraging basically the bureaucracy of our field to wholeheartedly support suicide attempt survivors in their personal disclosure and input. Before I do so though, I want to tell you a little bit about my experience with suicidality to explain how I became involved in this movement. I arguably came from a place of great privilege. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, one of four, with two loving and present parents. My family was very financially secure and we lived comfortably. I attended a private Roman Catholic grade school and a Jesuit high school. I achieved good grades, I had friends, and I played and excelled in sports. However, I was growing up in a community and a society that told me I was different, that I was inadequate, that I was flawed because I was gay. From an early age, that very small seed of self-doubt was planted in my mind and unfortunately, that seed took root. As I continued living with my secret, terrified that someone would find out about my flaw, that seed grew into a strong and pervasive source of shame and self-hatred. As it grew stronger, I attempted to prove my worthiness. I sought refuge in my achievements, but they were never enough. So I achieved more and better and faster, but it still was never enough. It didn't take long for this inadequacy script, inadequacy script to move beyond my accomplishments and become focused on my very being. I had to compensate by becoming more capable, more intelligent, more mature, and more popular. Soon enough, every school assignment became a chance for me to criticize my stupidity and my laziness. Every late or missed meeting was a chance to criticize my short-sightedness. Every disagreement, a chance to criticize my ignorance. Every interaction with friends was a chance to criticize my awkwardness. Every compliment I received was a chance to criticize my own vanity and hubris. I hated myself. I reached such a deep, dark place that I began to feel it would be much easier to take my life than to continue living, and I attempted to make it so. My solution was to end it all, to no longer burden my friends and family, to no longer deal with the euphoric highs of my successes and the subsequent crushing lows of my self-loathing. On January 18th, 2011, in my sophomore year of my undergraduate program, I attempted suicide. I spent two nights in a psychiatric ward following my attempt, and it was there that I realized just how enveloping my self-hatred was. It was there that I realized the necessity of cultivating my self-love. And it was there that I began the long path to recovery. Immediately following my hospitalization, I realized that one of the biggest factors that contributed to my suicide attempt was stigma itself. The social stigma of mental health was single-handedly scaring me into isolation. Even when it was blatantly apparent that my emotional distress was far out of my control, 
Stigma prevented me from seeking the help that could have prevented me from attempting suicide. With that realization, I began to dedicate my work to breaking down the barriers of silence surrounding mental illness. I joined student organizations and coalitions dedicated to improving campus resources. I became trained in, organ in, excuse me, in recognizing mental distress among my peers and referring them to available resources. I produced a short film that visually depicted the impact of stigma, which quickly went viral in my university's community and simulated conversation about stress, anxiety, and depression. As my advocacy work continued to expand, I simultaneously, and I cannot stress this enough, slowly and incrementally began to disclose more and more about my own experiences. It was on the two-year anniversary of my attempt that I first truly, fully, and publicly disclosed my history through a Facebook post. The reaction among my friends was a stunning display of support and camaraderie. And the majority of my family and friends messaged me to tell me about their own experiences with mental illness. Interestingly, on many occasions now, people have questioned why I would feel the need to be so open, especially on the internet. People have expressed concern that my extensive self-disclosure could come back to haunt me in my future. And this seems to be the source of the hesitation, the perceived liability in supporting suicide attempt survivors that I would like to speak to you about. Just recently, there was actually a blog post published by a researcher in our field titled, quote, what if we really got rid of the shame about suicide? In it, the author speaks to the growing movement of openness among suicide attempt survivors and questions the ethical implications of any kind of organizational support for attempt survivors who decide to disclose their history. At one point, the author states, and I quote, these are arguably vulnerable people putting highly sensitive information out there where it cannot be controlled. The author actually goes on to talk about my story and me specifically after he saw a YouTube video in which I discussed my suicide attempt. Speak of, speaking of me, he asks, Misha is apparently unabashed about this self-disclosure. Is this okay? Is he harming himself now or potentially in the future with a video that he can never take back? Does the empowerment and destigmatization bring more benefit to his psychological health than the cost of any judgment that he might experience from others who don't get it? To be realistic, these are very valid questions. I would be lying if I said I haven't felt the consequences of my disclosure before. A few specific, truly awkward interviews and dates come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> so for this reason, I obviously do not want to imply in any way that all suicide attempt survivors should be open about their experiences. It is a very personal and unique process for every individual, and they need to feel comfortable and safe in their disclosure. Having said, for me, these small, relatively insignificant incidents are quite easy to dismiss because of one simple fact. This movement is about something much greater than me. This movement is about saving lives in the best way that we, a community of suicide attempt survivors, can. By saying we are attempt survivors, we are proactively breaking down the barriers of silence and we are helping people seek help. In fact, by publicly saying the words, I am a suicide attempt survivor to you today, I am doing much more than simply shedding light on a dark time in my past and consequently making myself very vulnerable to real labeling, stereotyping, and discrimination. When I say I am a suicide attempt survivor, I'm saying it for the people who are currently gripped by the isolation and hopelessness that once gripped me. I'm doing it for the people who are searching for stories on Google that might give them the slightest bit of hope that they may live a healthy and rewarding life one day. I'm doing it to show them that seeking help is okay. But also, know that when I say I am a suicide attempt survivor, I'm saying it for me. I now live in a society that tries to tell me, you are different, you are inadequate, you are flawed because you are mentally ill. But this time, unlike before, I will not let that seed grow in my mind. I will not remain silent. I will not live with a secret 
thereby giving credence to someone else's misguided judgments about me. I choose to embrace my differences, and I have become stronger and healthier for it. And I will love myself for everything that I am. That is why I'm open about my experiences. To finish, I would assert that our field could advance exponentially by cultivating the unique lived expertise of the attempt survivor. Going forward, I hope that the bureaucracy of our field continues to ask, how can we, as clinicians, researchers, and academics, further incorporate the vital voices of attempt survivors into our work? With unbridled support from the powers that be in our field, we can truly expand our destigmatization efforts and we can save lives. Thank you for your time today. My name is Craig Miller. I am a suicide attempt survivor, and I don't think I've ever been more proud in my entire life. <laughs> the greatest lesson I think I've ever learned in my life is the need for balance. And not so much the need for balance, but first, what needs to be balanced? And then the maintenance and the achievement of that balance. For me, the two most important things that I hold sacred and dearest to myself is my mind and my heart. Or more importantly, trust and belief. Trust to me and in our, in our mind means it's solid, it's concrete, it's predictable, it's scientific, it's repeatable. We trust in things that we know are true. We trust in our minds when they work properly. And belief comes from our hearts. Belief you can't measure. Belief is, it's in us and you can't explain it. You can't tell anybody what it is, you just feel it. And that's an exercise of our hearts. I think the first time in my life when I really recognized how imbalanced those two things were to me, I was eight years old. I stood in my kitchen and I held a knife to my chest and I thought, what it would be like to not have to experience life anymore. It was the first time I considered suicide. Life was very, very difficult for me as a child. I was being molested at that age. I came from a broken home. I was being bullied for being molested. And I remember standing there in my kitchen and thinking, I can't trust anything or anyone. I can't trust life. But there was part of me that held on so hard, this part of me in my heart that said, it's gonna be okay. It's just gonna be okay, just keep going. Let's keep going. And I remember putting the knife down that day and feeling ex the experiences of my mental health declining at eight years old. The next few years and through several years in my teenage life, I developed serious mental health issues with obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, anxiety, and what I will classify myself as a mental health issue, fear. Fear absolutely consumed me and controlled me. And all the while, I felt like my mind was breaking. My mind was falling apart. But all the while, I held on to that heart, that part of me that said, Craig, Tomorrow will be better. Just hang on. And suicide, the only way I can describe it to you is suicide was the first thought in my mind every single day. It was the filter in which every other thought that came in or out of my mind had to pass through. And despite the fact that I felt like my mind and my trust was breaking, my heart held on. But over the years, it got increasingly difficult to hear my heart to pay attention to my heart and to feel that belief in life. When I was 20 years old, I had just grown tired. I have no other way to describe it. I was tired, I was done. I thought to myself, if this is what life is, I don't want it. 
I don't want anything to do with it. And I made a very serious attempt at ending my life. But since then, for the last 15 years, I made it my number one priority to understand myself, my thoughts, how I was going to repair my mind that I thought was broken, seemingly thought was broken, how I was going to build my heart back to where it should be and where I was wanted it to be, and how I was going to maintain that balance within myself. I can tell you that it's been a very, very long journey and I believe wholeheartedly that I have achieved balance. I've learned to apply that balance, that heart and that mind, the trust and belief to every aspect of my life. In my job as a writer, as a speaker, as a husband, as a daddy. <laughs> and I can tell you being involved in the suicide prevention field, I feel that it is no exception to the rules of balance and how important they are. I think over the last few days, we finally recognized that first step in balance, and that's identifying what needs to be balanced. I can tell you as someone who has experienced suicide and thoughts of suicide for more than 20 years, suicide does not only happen in our mind. It happens in our hearts. And there's a heavy weight on the side of suicide prevention in the field that follows the science, it follows the mind, it follows the trust, it wants to understand the suicidal mind, and justifiably so. We need that. But we can't forget about the suicidal heart. And I firmly believe that the only way, the last year and a half that I've been speaking to people, I won't say the only way, the best way, <laughs> that you can speak to a suicidal heart is with a suicidal heart, with a heart that's been there, with a heart that's been broken, with a heart that's repaired itself, that's learned to grow, that's learned to love itself. That's how you connect. I'm so amazingly proud to know that we've identified the two things that need to be balanced. <laughs> now we have the job of creating that balance and maintaining that balance. We are attempt survivors. And I can tell you, we don't have all the answers. But we are here and willing to do everything it takes to help find those answers. So I invite you, all of you, please get involved in our project. Ask about our lives. Read our books. Hear us speak. The only way we're really going to continue to move forward into the future of suicide prevention is together. Thank you very much for your time. So we have six minutes for Q&A, go ahead. <laughs>
Thank you for starting it. Thank you for making it possible, pioneer people. Yeah. Heidi, you cannot go into the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I don't have any to ask. Thank you so, so much for coming. Yes, go ahead. So what's the biggest, what, what, what's the amazing part? <laughs> 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 don't, don't put the Google What? <laughs> You'll see it. You'll know it when you see it. You're not going to miss it. I'll tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it'll be, it's all right. Yeah, I hope it comes out. Oh my God, yes. Please. Um, so all of our contact information is up there and as a member of the social media team, I should tell you that it's very important that you share these links, that you retweet this stuff on Facebook, on Twitter, everywhere. Put it out there, please, because that's how this message is going to get past us. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. 